yeah, so I'm the mystery man. Who knows who I am? Well, I'm going to tell you actually, because I'm a little bit nervous as my first talk, uh, about how I fell in love. So this is, aw, this is an um, immersive theatre experience that um, I actually met my fiance at. So uh, I don't think we're in this audience, but yeah, can you see me anywhere? I don't know. No, I'm not in there. So um, the idea of this experience is that it's called Early Days of a Better Nation, and it's by a theatre company called Coney. And every 60, per 60 participants in this room are actually deliberating over the fate of a fictitious European country undergoing civil war. Wow, right? I entered this not expecting to find love. I was expecting to find heartbreak and, and war and moving resources around a game board and all this kind of stuff. And I, I met my partner there. So um, that's just to get rid of my nerves and to give you a little bit of a background as to why I'm interested in immersive theatre. It's really interesting what happens in this shared space. And to give you a bit of context, there's only three actors in, on, on this stage, and I think one of them's back there. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this event later, but let's get on to the talk. So the talk is actually about uh, the dialogue between immersive theater and games design. And one thing you should already note for the eagle-eyed, uh, not the creepy hand, um, the fact that why is there a curtain here? Because immersive theatre, if you don't know what it is, it's normally in people's minds seen as something where you have big expansive sets that you can explore, you can go into nooks and crannies and find the smallest detail. But actually that all is built upon the foundation of good theatre. And that's really important for what I'm going to talk about. Oh, that's my name. So, uh, really simple aim. I'm here to convince you to start a conversation with a theatre maker. That is what I want everyone in this room to do because there's something amazing going on, especially in London, and that is that theatre and games are getting together and doing some really cool shit. So that's what I want to do with this talk. So um, yeah, there's a couple of different things that you can offer. Um, and as people in the game community, you've got so many different skills, I'm not even going to bother trying to explain what they are, because you know what they are. You're able to bring a really unique perspective of design, whether it's designing audio or games design or um, any other aspect of building a game. And you've also got the skills and the pipelines that people in theatre don't quite have yet. But what do people in theatre have? Well, they've got some well, like thousands of years of experience collectively uh, on how space is used, on physicality, on how you move people around and, um, and how you incubate ideas. Theatre works with ideas in a much different way than it does with, uh, with video, video games work with ideas. So um, you may have heard of Punch Drunk. You may have heard of Secret Cinema. These sort of fall into the idea of immersive experiences, but uh, I think Elizabeth Simones came and gave a talk a little while ago, and she talked about live games. And this talk builds on that, really. I'm glad she gave that talk, because they're all sort of the same thing. The rump rumpus, where you have these uh, gaming experiences where you run around um, and try and complete quests. It's kind of the same secret cinema. And Escape the Rooms are surprisingly a little bit like video games. So there's a big crossover between all these things. But there's even more things. I know, like LARPs, flash mobs, location-based apps, all these things, alternative reality games, they're all sort of coming under the same umbrella. And really, what's quite nice is that there are people out there who are trying to codify this. It comes with a caveat. You should only try and codify things and make a nice big manual on how it works if you intend to break it. And um, Jason Warren has done just this. So uh, I actually met up with Jason Warren to talk about his book, Creating Worlds. And he really breaks down what it is that immersive theater in his definition really is. So um, he talks about Punch Drunk and he talks about uh, a brilliant theater company called You, Me, Bum Bum Train, which is the bizarrest name I've ever heard. It's got a picture of an aubergine for a logo. Um, they, they do very specific types of immersive theater. But what he, what Jason gets onto is this, which is interactive worlds. So they're kind of a mix. They're a mix of free roaming, walking around a giant warehouse, maybe with multiple rooms, um, and 
it's mixing that with a story arc that can actually be affected by the audience. Punch Drunk admittedly has some amazing set design skills, but do they actually let you change the story? I don't think so. Um, uh, and and these, these kind of situations where you're getting people affecting the story, there's a lot of improv that needs to happen, so that's where you need your theatre makers. Uh, and one more thing, they tend to like to hide game mechanics, which, as game designers, that can sometimes sound a bit strange. Why do we want to hide game mechanics? Because sometimes we want flow, we don't want people to have to see press the A button a billion times, uh, <coughs> Ubisoft. Um, but Sometimes you want to show stuff, you want to show tutorials. So these kind of events don't give you that. They want you to be a human in the space. They don't want you to be a player. Now that's interesting to me. It might be interesting for you guys too. So, but then you move on to something called game theater, um, which kind of falls under the umbrella still, but it's a little strange because it highlights the rules. It gets people engaged in the rules. The rules are the story. Um, I'm actually here with my good friend Joe Ball, who's also a director, uh, as well as a great friend. Um, and we made an experience called Revolution. And in that experience, you really are involved in the rules and you're aware of them. And that keeps things ticking over. Uh, you, the attention is on the structures and we're asking people to both compete and cooperate, which are two useful techniques in game theatre. So why, why bother make all these Definitions though, right? You know. Well, when you make a definition for something, you can actually focus a little bit more in on what it is you want to do. So we set off with Revolution for a very simple plan. We wanted the simplest game you could possibly think of, uh, develop it a little bit, not too much, and then build theater in the spaces between the participants playing the game. So um, this is a digital game board that I designed um, and made in Unity. Uh, there's actually two terminals, one terminal that's projected and another terminal that's hidden that the, um, the operator can play. And everybody in the room has to make tactical decisions which will then influence the board. But those tactical decisions are given to me uh, or whoever's the operator on a piece of paper uh, that often has been scrawled extremely quickly because we only give them a few seconds to make those orders in reality. But the real interesting thing is when all these people in their different factions that we set them up in start to interact. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Elegance, the mighty dolphin. Um, so this is what Jason talks quite a lot about. Uh, the idea that immersive work should keep its mechanics hidden. I'm coming back to this point because it underpins something that I think video games um, actually has tackled really well. I mean, think about the Stanley Parable. In the Stanley Parable, you're not really given any tutorial or instruction on how to move around the world. It's kind of intuitive. For anyone who's used a mouse and a keyboard, moving around is simple as pie. Um, so you're actually in that experience straight away and the narrative experience is what governs your understanding of that world, of what can be done and what can't be done. So video games, despite being mechanically quite heavy, are actually elegant in some ways. But the reverse is true. I don't think we have to always hide mechanics and immersive experiences definitely can use them to their advantage. Uh, so here's a really good point. When you walk into one of these experiences, it's kind of like entering a new world. You know, it's like putting on the VR headset. Uh, there's disorientation, there's unsurety, there's, there's fear. What am I gonna be asked to do? This is kind of the idea of the magic circle. You're walking into the magic circle and if you go into that circle and you're not convinced of it, you're just gonna walk right back out and not really care, I guess. Um, so the first scene that anyone encounters in an immersive performance, that is one of the most important because it lays down the rules. The rules are the thing that are going to determine how your audience plays the rest of the game. But I mean that very literally. If you teach them that it's okay to stand in the corner and just huddle up and be really afraid, they'll do that throughout the whole performance and there'll be nothing you can do to stop it. So you have to be really careful what you do at the beginning. With video games, what do we do at the beginning of a video game? We give a tutorial, we give an insight into how you're gonna play that game. And 
the clear that is, but also the way that that is built into the elegance of the experience, that is what makes a great experience. So entry processes are really important for both video games and for immersive theatre. Oh, that way. Um, all right, so I'm gonna try and zoom through this because I probably haven't got a lot of time. Living spaces, this is one of the chapters that Jason worked on and he talks about a couple of different things. So he talks about how the psyche of a room affects the, uh, the, the participants in an immersive theatre piece. So I'm walking along and uh, I'm entering a big room. Let's imagine none of you are in the room at the moment and you're all in the bar next door and you start filtering in. If the room's empty, what do you think you're gonna do? There's no chairs. Are you gonna stand in the middle of the room? I mean, actually no. It's proven that audiences like to move to the edge of the room and they hang around. And that can kill a performance if you are expecting all of your audience members to jump right into the middle. So what do you do? You put chairs down, you put tables in, you change that space. And this idea of breaking the void is really important. Um, a void is, in Jason's terms, a zone. And a zone can be made up out of lots of different objects at the middle of these zones. And they draw people in. Um, and zones are defined by boundaries. Now, boundaries are interesting because boundaries are intangible. They're not really things that necessarily are physical. This bar here has a boundary. I can't go behind unless I really want a drink. But um, really, there are many types of boundaries. For example, a spotlight. Now, I'm just gonna do a little thought experiment. So let's imagine there's a spotlight in this room and it's shining down. Do you think people are gonna stand in the spotlight or outside of the spotlight? Anyone? Uh, you're all wrong. It actually, they go around the outside. They hover in the boundary between. So warm lights and natural light is one of the most engaging things for people in interactive experiences because it shows them a place that they can be safe. And if they're in it, that's not so safe, they're visible, but the boundary is a great place to be when you're in an immersive experience. So we can use that as a tool. And if you look at uh, design generally for spaces in video games, like level design, it's all based on moving people around the space, moving a player in such a way that you're in control of where they're going, but they feel like they're in control. Um, so Uncharted does a really good job of this. Um, the level design um, stuff that they do uh, is fantastic. Um, everything makes you feel like you're moving forward. Um, we can make immersive experiences like this, but we need your help. We need people who can think like this in immersive in theater. That way. So uh, last little thing I'll talk about is living choices. So there's another chapter. And um, so this is just a, another little tidbit that I'm picking out from um, the book. So it's really important to make your interactions um, based around the freedoms that you want the audience to experience. So if I wanted you all now to have the freedom to draw graffiti on the walls, uh, I'd supply you with the ability to do that. But I'd probably teach you not to go spraying it on each other's faces. How would I do that? Well, I've got to establish that somehow, but that's a really extreme example. But that would be a, a, not a very impactful freedom. You know, yes, you could do lots of crazy stuff, but you'd probably get bored after a while. But it's a lot more impactful, for example, in uh, our performance of Revolution, if you tell people that they have the ability to uh, strategize on a board, or they have a, the ability to enact missions, that means they'll be going backwards and forwards between other factions in the room. So suddenly you're giving them a choice. Do I play it safe, and, or do I really like strategy, or do I really like interacting with people? And that's a freedom that you give them. But really, it's a freedom that you're in control of. So robust is really important. You want to be in control of these freedoms. Sorry if I'm going on a lot, guys. I know, it's nearly the end. So uh, factions. So factions are really easy. Uh, they happen in video games all the time. Um, Templars and assassins, for example, um, as much as we love them. The, they're really important because they give players and participants a context for why they're in the game. 
if, a store, if you storify the role of um, a player or a participant, you're effectively giving them license to play in this world, but they're role playing. And that's where it links back up to LARPing and such. Um, balanced is really important. If you tell everyone in the room that they're all kings and all of the actors are servants, it's going to be crazy. And I kind of want to do that anyway. I want to make a show that does that. But you can't give them too much power, but you can't make it uninteresting. Like if you tell them they're all peasants, but the, the, the people in charge, the, the runners of the show are kings, then they're going to feel underpowered. But if you make everyone peasants and there's a peasant who's only slightly more above them, who's in control, then you create interesting dynamics. Uh, this is a video, ooh, yeah, I will request access. Uh-oh, 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 no, it's not gonna work, oh well. Uh, uh, how do I get back in? Just there. There we go. I'll tell you what it was though. It was a video um, of, sorry? Act it out. Act it out. Oh god, okay. Just tell us. <laughs> it was. Um, it was basically one of the uh, people who took part in Revolution. They were so ecstatic uh, to be given the mission to record a video that announced the, um, the beliefs and manifesto of their faction in the Revolution for London. So they gave a 30 second um, video and she basically went absolutely crazy about the fact that her, um, her faction were going to give cameras to everyone and they were going to be super authoritarian and she was really happy about that. She was like, yeah, we're going to be like, we're going to be secret police style like level of, um, of revolution. And, and she was really happy. And we've got loads of videos like that. We've got people really engaged with the role. And I kind of just wanted to show you the impact of meaningful choice. Um, in these kind of events, but I can show you that video another time. So really just touching the surface uh, with all this and um, the overlaps of video games, I hope you're starting to see are, are a lot more apparent than they first seem. Um, you all most likely could get involved with a theater maker. There's one right there, talk to him um, and, and make something amazing. Um, so that's my talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>